Hi students. Good day. This Mr. J. de los Santos. Last meeting. We discuss about the history of America from pre-Columbian era to 1877. And for this video lecture. I will present a concluding note on the history of America from the rise of industry to the post-Cold War period. Before the lecture begins. Ready yourself. Your pen and paper for note taking. Okay? Are you ready? If yes, then let's start. The development of industrial America. In the decades following the Civil War, as the United States pursued empire in the American West, new problems replaced the old issues of slavery and sectionalism. The growing power of big business, the exploitation of labor and natural resources, corruption in politics. Ethnic and racial tensions exacerbated by colonial expansion. An unparalleled immigration dominated the debates of the day in both East and West of America. As the 19th century ended, Americans had more questions than answers. With this, the question would be. Could the American promise survive in the new world of corporations, wage labor, and mushrooming cities? Neither out of place nor out of time. The West contributed its share to both the promise and the problems of the era Mark Twain would brand as the Gilded Age. Perhaps no other era in American history spawned greed, corruption, and vulgarity on so grand a scale. An era when speculators like Jay Gould not only built but wrecked businesses to turn paper profits. An era when business boasted openly of buying politicians, who in turn lined their pockets at the public's expense. Nevertheless, the Gilded Age was not without its share of solid achievements. In these years, America made the leap into the Industrial Age. Factories and refineries poured out American steel and oil at unprecedented rates. Businessmen like Carnegie, Rockefeller, and Morgan developed new strategies to consolidate American industry. New inventions, including the telephone and electric light and power, changed Americans' everyday lives. By the end of the 19th century, the country had achieved industrial maturity. It boasted the largest, most innovative, most productive economy in the world. No other era in the nation's history witnessed such a transformation. Yet the changes that came with these developments worried many Americans and gave rise to the era's political turmoil. Race and gender profoundly influenced American politics, leading to new political alliances. Women's organizations championed causes, notably suffrage and temperance, and challenged prevailing views of woman's proper sphere. Reformers fought corruption by instituting civil service. And new issues, the tariff, the regulation of the trusts, and currency reform, restructured the nation's politics. Hence, the Gilded Age witnessed a nation transformed. Where dusty roads and cattle trails once sprawled across the continent, steel rails now bound the country together. Cities grew exponentially, not only with new inhabitants from around the globe but also with new bridges, subways, and skyscrapers. Thus, America's cities in the late 19th century teemed with life. Municipal governments, straining to build the new cities, experienced the rough and tumble of machine politics as bosses and their constituents looked to profit from city growth. Reformers deplored the graft and corruption that accompanied the rise of the cities. But they were rarely able to oust the party bosses for long. Because they failed to understand the services the political machines provided for their largely immigrant and poor constituents. As well as the ties between the politicians and wealthy businessmen who sought to benefit from franchises and contracts. For America's workers, urban industrialism along with the rise of big business and corporate consolidation drastically changed the workplace. Industrialists replaced skilled workers with new machines that could be operated by cheaper unskilled labor. And during hard times, employers did not hesitate to cut workers' already meager wages. As the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 demonstrated, when labor united, it could bring the nation to attention. Organization held out the best hope for the workers. First the Knights of Labor and later the American Federation of Labor won converts among the nation's working class. But the Great Depression came in the 1890s. Trying to keep up with the industrialization. Railroads were quickly built and eventually, overbuilt. 
Mines were also opened and precious metals flooded the marketplace, driving down values. Many famers were in debt due to inflation. Mounting anger and frustration led workers and farmers to join forces and create a grassroots movement to fight for change under the banner of a new People's Party, also known as the Populist Movement. The Populists were an agrarian-based political movement aimed at improving conditions for the country's farmers and agrarian workers. The Emergence of Modern America The bitter depression that began in 1893 led to increased labor strife. The Pullman boycott brutally dramatized the power of property and the conservatism of the laissez-faire state. But workers' willingness to confront capitalism on the streets eloquently testified to labor's growing determination, unity, and strength. As the Depression deepened, the sight of Coxey's army of unemployed marching on Washington to demand federal intervention in the economy signaled a growing shift in the public mind against the stand-pat politics of laissez-faire. The call for the government to take action to better the lives of workers, farmers, and the dispossessed manifested itself in the fiercely fought presidential campaign of William Jennings Bryan in 1896. With the outbreak of the Spanish-American War in 1898, the decade ended on a harmonious note with patriotic Americans rallying around the flag. Although few questioned America's foray into overseas empire, but the United States took its place on the world stage. Banking on that idea, now let me ask you students. Why do you think the United States abandoned its isolationist foreign policy in the 1890s? From your readings, what would be the reasons? Now let's discuss. Background on isolationism. Since the nation's founding, American foreign policy had been organized around a commitment to remaining outside European affairs and keeping Europe out of its own. Manifest Destiny The work of fulfilling Manifest Destiny through continental expansion had largely kept the United States out of European late 19th century empire building. Commercial Expansion Economic depression at home an expanding production capacity in the 1890s led some American businessmen to look abroad for new markets. Business interests expected, and often received, the support of the United States in their international ventures. Sometimes including the annexation of distant lands. Concern about access to Chinese markets led to the United States' successful advocacy for an open-door policy in China. To ensure universal access to Chinese markets and to protect Chinese sovereignty. Monroe Doctrine in the late 19th century. The United States responded to European imperialism in the Western Hemisphere through diplomacy and the threat of violence to assert its primacy in the region. The government was closely allied with business interests to achieve hegemony in Latin America and the Caribbean. Given all these reasons, America abandoned its isolationist policy. But even though Americans basked in patriotism and contemplated empire, Old grievances had not been laid to rest. The People's Party had been beaten. But the populists call for greater government involvement in the economy, expanded opportunities for direct democracy, and a more equitable balance of profits and power between the people and the big corporations, sounded the themes that would be taken up by a new generation of progressive reformers in the first decades of the 20th century. Progressivism was never a radical movement. Its goal remained to reform the existing system, by government intervention if necessary, but without uprooting any of the traditional American political, economic, or social institutions. But although progressivism was never radical, neither was it the laissez-faire liberalism of the previous century. Progressives' willingness to use the power of government to regulate business and achieve a measure of social justice redefined liberalism in the 20th century, tying it to the expanded power of the state. Progressivism contained many paradoxes. A diverse coalition of individuals and interests. The progressive movement began at the grassroots but left as its legacy a stronger presidency and unprecedented federal involvement in the economy and social welfare. A movement that believed in social justice, progressivism often promoted social control. And while progressives called for greater democracy, they fostered elitism with their worship of experts and efficiency. Whatever its inconsistencies and limitations, progressivism took action to deal with the problems posed by urban industrialism. 
Progressivism saw grassroots activists address social problems on the local and state levels and search for national solutions. By increasing the power of the presidency and expanding the power of the state, progressives work to bring about greater social justice and to achieve a better balance between government and business. Jane Addams and Theodore Roosevelt could lay equal claim to the movement that redefined liberalism and launched the liberal state of the 20th century. However, the war on a global scale would provide progressivism with yet another challenge even before it had completed its ambitious agenda. America's experience in World War I was exceptional. For much of the world, the Great War produced great destruction, acres of blackened fields, ruined factories, and millions of casualties. But in the United States, war and prosperity marched hand in hand. America emerged from the war with the strongest economy in the world and a position of international preeminence. I'm back. Now let me ask you again. From your readings, why did the United States at first resist intervening in World War I? Why did it later retreat from this policy? Now let's discuss early reasons for neutrality. Since early in the nation's founding, the United States had officially tried to remain outside European disputes. Facing the First World War, Wilson feared U.S. intervention would disrupt American trade with opposing European nations at a time when the nation's economy remained vulnerable. Further, he worried the heterogeneous nation of immigrants might dissolve into conflict in sympathy with the disputes of citizens' countries of origin. Causes contributing to the retreat from neutrality. British blockade of Germany. Although the United States maintained that its neutrality meant that it should be allowed to continue trading with all parties in the conflict, the powerful British Navy quickly established an economic blockade of Germany. The United States vigorously protested but acquiesced to this development. Germany responded by using U boats to attack ships trying to enter British ports. Attack on the Lusitania. As part of its attempt to blockade British ports, Germany attacked the Lusitania, a vessel carrying many Americans and munitions. This development pushed some Americans toward supporting intervention and forced Wilson to state publicly his willingness to break diplomatic relations with Germany should such provocations occur again. U.S. Trade with Britain The United States shared political, cultural and linguistic ties with England tipped American sympathies toward Great Britain and its allies. Even when neutrality was the official posture. Further, supplying Britain and its allies had helped the United States overcome its economic downturn and brought prosperity. Which Wilson was disinclined to sacrifice in order to honor neutrality. Zimmerman Telegram. Responding to the United States continued financial and trading support of Great Britain. Germany warned that it would begin attacking any ships entering British waters, including American vessels. Wilson hoped that he might still be able to avoid American intervention. But the Zimmerman telegram escalated the conflict and convinced him Germany was engaged in a war against democracy. In the telegram, Germany promised the return of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona to Mexico if it declared war on the United States. This escalation meant that when Germany did attack American vessels, Congress declared war on Germany in April 1917. Still, the nation paid a heavy price both at home and abroad. American soldiers and sailors encountered unprecedented horrors. Submarines, poison gas, machine guns. And more than 100,000 died. Rather than permanently improving working conditions, advancing public health, and spreading educational opportunity, as progressives had hoped, the war threatened to undermine the achievements of the previous two decades. Moreover, rather than promoting democracy in the United States, the war bred fear, intolerance, and repression that led to a crackdown on dissent and a demand for conformity. Reformers could count only woman's suffrage as a permanent victory. Woodrow Wilson had promised more than anyone could deliver. Progressive hopes of extending democracy and liberal reform nationally and internationally were dashed. In 1920, a bruised and disillusioned society stumbled into a new decade. The era coming to an end had called on Americans to crusade and sacrifice. Hence, the new era promised peace, prosperity, and a good time. In the aftermath of World War I, 
America turned its back on progressive crusades and embraced conservative Republican politics. The growing influence of corporate leaders, and business values. Changes in the nation's economy. Henry Ford's automobile revolution, advertising, mass production, propelled fundamental change throughout society. Living standards rose, economic opportunity increased. And Americans threw themselves into private pleasures. Rural America was almost entirely left out of the Roaring Twenties. Country folk, deeply suspicious and profoundly discontented, championed prohibition, revived the Klan, attacked immigration, and defended old-time Protestant religion. Just as the dazzle of the Roaring Twenties hid deep divisions in society. Extravagant prosperity masked structural flaws in the economy. The crash of 1929 and the depression that followed starkly revealed the economy's crises of international trade and consumption. Hard times swept high living off the front pages of the nation's newspapers. Different images emerged. Hobos hopping freight trains, strikers confronting police, malnourished sharecroppers staring blankly into the distance. Empty apartment buildings alongside cardboard shantytowns. And mountains of food rotting in the sun while guards with shotguns chased away the hungry. The depression hurt everyone, but the poor were hurt most. As farmers and workers sank into aching hardship, businessmen rallied around Herbert Hoover to proclaim that private enterprise would get the country moving again. But things fell apart, and Hoover faced increasingly radical opposition. Membership in the socialist and communist parties surged, and more and more Americans contemplated desperate measures. By 1932, the Depression had nearly brought the nation to its knees. America faced its greatest crisis since the Civil War and citizens demanded new leaders who would save them from the Hoover Depression. The New Deal replaced the fear symbolized by Hoover's expulsion of the Bonus Army with Roosevelt's confidence, optimism, and energetic pragmatism. A growing majority of Americans agreed with Franklin Roosevelt that the federal government should help those in need, thereby strengthening the political coalition that propelled the New Deal. In the process of seeking relief for victims of the Depression, recovery of the general economy, and basic reform of major economic institutions. The New Deal vastly expanded the size and influence of the federal government and changed the way the American people viewed Washington. New Dealers achieved significant victories, such as social security, labor's right to organize, and guarantees that farm prices would be maintained through controls on production and marketing. Thus, the New Deal measures marked the emergence of a welfare state. But the New Deal's limited, two-tier character left many needy Americans with little aid. Even though millions of Americans benefited directly from the alphabet soup of agencies and programs, both relief and recovery were limited and temporary. In 1940, the Depression still plagued the economy. The most durable New Deal achievements were reforms that stabilized agriculture, encouraged the organization of labor unions, and created the safety net of social security and fair labor standards. Although authoritarian governments and anti-capitalist policies were common outside the United States during the 1930s, they were shunned by the New Deal coalition. However, the greatest economic crisis the nation had ever faced did not cause Americans to abandon democracy. As happened in Germany, where Adolf Hitler seized dictatorial power. Nor did the nation turn to radical alternatives such as socialism or communism. Republicans and other conservatives claimed that the New Deal amounted to a form of socialism that threatened democracy and capitalism. But rather than attack capitalism, Franklin Roosevelt sought to save it, and he succeeded. That success also marked the limits of the New Deal's achievements. Franklin Roosevelt believed that a strengthened national government was necessary to curb the destructive tendencies of concentrated economic power. A shift of authority toward the federal government would allow capitalist enterprises to be balanced by the nation's democratic tradition. The New Deal stopped far short of challenging capitalism either by undermining private property or by imposing strict national planning. New Dealers repeatedly described their programs as a kind of warfare against the economic adversities of the 1930s. In the next decade, with the Depression only partly vanquished, the Roosevelt administration had to turn from the New Deal's war against economic crisis at home to participate in a worldwide conflagration to defeat the enemies of democracy abroad.